You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Now, it should come as no surprise to us that the exodus of the Hebrews begins in Exodus, uh, led by a man called Moses, who actually was a prophet. And what he's going to find is, uh, brothers and sisters, that, well, when we think about the Exodus, it really does cement the tone, doesn't it, of the deliverance of Israel. And we can take that theme and run with it all the way through the scriptures that, well, there's going to be a deliverance of the Gentiles. There's a deliverance out of sin, isn't there, from bondage. But, you know, Moses was going to find terrible disappointment with Israel. And we just read of those words there in Exodus chapter 32. He was a man who was rejected by his own people, was Moses. And in great despondency, he goes there on behalf of Israel to speak to God himself, who we believe is Michael the Archangel. Now, many years later, there was going to be another prophet and another man of Israel who was going to find exactly the same situation. His name was Elijah. And Elijah the prophet also was going to find terrible heartache in the children of Israel as they too were found not worshipping a molten calf, but worshipping, well, Baal, the god of the Canaanites. And it should come as no surprise to us, brothers and sisters, that when we look at the life of Elijah in terrible despondency and despair, where does he go to to flee from Israel? Well, it tells us in 1 Kings 19, he goes to the wilderness. Well, that's fascinating, isn't it? Because he's going to the very place where it all began many years before with a man called Moses. He's going right back to the origins of the story of Israel. And actually, we're given a little bit more detail as to where Elijah fled to. He didn't just go to the wilderness, brothers and sisters. Can anyone remember which particular place in the wilderness he went to? It was Mount Horeb. And Mount Horeb just so happens to be in the place of Sinai. And Mount Horeb just so happens to be the very place, the very mount, the very location in which Moses stood in the breach of Israel. And have a guess what, brothers and sisters? We've just read the words. In Exodus 32, Moses stood at the same mount years later Elijah was going to go to. He's resetting the clocks, isn't he? He wants to reverse time and go right back to where it all began with Israel and start afresh. How many times have we tried to do that, brothers and sisters? Start afresh. And we get that clean slate, don't we, from the Lord Jesus Christ when we beseech him in prayer. But this is a different tone with Elijah. He's going to reset the course of history or trying to reset the course of history because he feels Israel have become no better than what they were in the times of Moses. Time hasn't changed for Elijah, so he wants to go back in time to begin again. So so with that in mind, we're going to just quickly fly through the two stories of Elijah and Moses. And it's actually beautiful, really, because, well, we we, we know the stories of Moses and Elijah because they're famous stories, aren't they? Now, when we come to 1 Kings 18, and there's no need to turn there, brothers and sisters, because it's all it's all on the slides, nice and easy. But when we come to 1 Kings 18, Elijah is told to go and greet Ahab, the king of Israel, and his wicked, sinister queen, Jezebel. And he goes to Samaria after being in a particular land. Where had Elijah spent the majority of his time prior to his arrival in Samaria? He'd been in Israel. But then he went all the way up north and he spent a bit of time with a widow, didn't he? And a son. In other words, Elijah had spent a long time in the land of the Gentiles. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, God comes to him and says, go to the king of Israel. What other man in the Bible spent a bit of time in the land of the Gentiles before the word of God came to him to go to a king? Well, I think it was Moses, wasn't it? Moses, too, spent a bit of time in the land of the Gentiles. In fact, he spent 40 years in the land of Midian before God came to him and says, go to the king of Egypt. And when Moses comes to the king of Egypt in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 10 to 11, well, Moses has a message, doesn't he? He has a message to the king of Egypt called Pharaoh, and he says to him, let my people go. And our children sing those words, don't they? One of the in one of the songs they sing. And I'm telling you, Moses wouldn't have sang those words. It would have been, let my people go. And we know the repercussions of this, because the more Moses asked of Pharaoh, the more Pharaoh hardened his 
heart, didn't he? And so when Elijah then, many years later, in the very same spirit, is told to go to the king of Israel, in many ways, Elijah too was saying to Ahab, let my people go. He was requesting for Ahab to unleash Israel from the clutches of Jezebel, his wicked queen. And the more Elijah requested this, well, the more Ahab, it says, provoked the Lord his God. In other words, in 1 Kings 16, verse 35 and 33, Ahab hardened his heart. Just like Pharaoh. Now, when Moses comes to Egypt and, well, Pharaoh hardened his heart, well, God says, I would smite the land with a curse. And, well, we begin the curses with one particular one in mind. It's to do with a river. As Moses turned the river Nile into blood, didn't he? In fact, the words we're told is in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 24, that the Egyptians tried to find water, but the water, it says, was cut off. In fact, it tells us that the Egyptians tried to dig for water, but the Egyptians couldn't find any water because there was no water provided. There was a drought, brothers and sisters, in the land of Egypt, a curse. What happened when Elijah came to the king of Israel and asked him to say, let my people go? What did Elijah say to Ahab? He says, I'm going to smite this land with a curse, didn't he? And can anyone remember what the curse was? There was going to be a drought. In fact, Elijah says, God is to close the heavens upon this land. And we can see, can't we, very quickly, if we follow the two stories chronologically, that they're both walking in the same spirit. Well, Moses was a hero of Elijah's. He was a titan of faith to him. And when, well, uh, Moses said to Pharaoh, I curse this land and the river turns to blood. Can anyone remember what Pharaoh did next? He, he got a group, didn't he, called the magicians and with their magic tricks. They tried to conjure up something that could mimic a river turning to blood, but it was no hope. They were outmatched, outmaneuvered, outclassed altogether, weren't they? Who did Ahab bring to the table to help him fight the cause of Samaria against Yahweh, the God of Israel? He didn't bring the magicians, but he did bring the prophets of Baal, didn't he? And in like manner, they too were totally outmatched from the Almighty God of the heavens, the prophets. Of Baal. Now, what was the thrust of Moses's message? Well, he met God first in a little cave in none other than the place of Horeb in the land of Midian. And there was a flickering fire, wasn't there? An unquenched fire that burned brightly. And there God spoke to Moses the prophet in the middle of the fire and asked him to go to the land of the Egyptians to request Israel to come out of its clutches. And before God even gives him the message, God gives a title for himself. And it's not, I will be whom I will be. It's something a little bit before. God says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. He said those words in a fire, didn't he? What was to happen at Mount Carmel, by the way, with Elijah? What was to come down? What was to come down from heaven? Fire wasn't there. A divine fire was to come down on Mount Carmel. And do you know what Elijah said to bring the fire down? The exact words he said was, I call upon the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel. And so just as God answered Moses by a fire, so too God was to answer Elijah in a fire. And just as God had said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in a fire, so too Elijah was to request of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because Moses and Elijah both knew that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob answers in fire. And Elijah knew this. Oh, he knew the story of Moses like the back of his hand, did Elijah because he's walking in the footsteps of the hero he so deeply loves. Now, when Israel came out of Egypt, something miraculous happened. There was another miracle, wasn't there? Moses put his rod, or Aaron's rod, into some water, and the Red Sea rent in two, didn't it? That's a tricky question, this, and it's a rhetorical one, but what was the exact wording of the parting of the Red Sea? The waters didn't just split, did they? 
something came from the heavens that allowed the water to rend in two. It was an east wind. Thank you, Brother Andrew. And an east wind came and split the waters in two, and the blistering wind came, didn't it? Now, when Elijah called the fire of God from heaven, what was the next miracle that was presented on Carmel that fateful day? A wind came, and the rains poured upon the earth. And so just as Moses walked through the wind and the rain, so Elijah, it says, he didn't walk, did he, brothers and sisters? Elijah didn't walk. He ran with all of his might. God was answering him in the very spirit of Moses. And Elijah, brothers and sisters, I truly believe it. He believed that he was leading a second exodus, not out of Egypt, but out of Samaria. And brothers and sisters, this man's heart is going to be utterly shattered. Because God has other ideas. The exodus has happened. And Elijah's got to learn this valuable lesson. If you look at one, if you've got your Bibles, brothers and sisters, handy. Let's just have a look at 1 Kings 18. And, and you'll notice that in 1 Kings verse 18, Elijah, you know, what a character he was and, and what a man he was. He, he goes before Israel and, and, and there in utter confidence, utter boldness, he says to them, choose you a God. If you be on Baal's side, join Baal. If you be on Yahweh's side, join Yahweh. And then in verse 38, a flaming burst of fire descended from Mount Carmel from the heavens and licked up the sacrifice. Now, here is a mountain on fire in Mount Carmel. We have a mountain on fire in which we have a prophet going before Israel saying, choose you a God, obey the Lord. Now, many years prior, Moses was going to lead Israel to the foot of Mount Sinai. And on behalf of God, he was going to be for, he was going to go before all of Israel and he was going to say to them, choose the Lord and obey his voice. And behind him, towering above, was Sinai. Can anyone remember what Sinai looked like at that precise moment? It was on fire, brothers and sisters. Sinai was lit up by the flames of the Almighty. Sinai and Carmel are entwined together. In other words, when Elijah goes before Israel, Mount Carmel looked just like Mount Sinai centuries before. As he goes before Israel and says, choose you a God. Hope, brothers and sisters, he believes he's the second Moses. As he goes before Israel and the fire descends down from heaven. Now, before Moses goes up to Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 24, he does something really interesting. Once the children of Israel had agreed the covenant and they all said, we obey, to cement this deal, this transaction, this, this wager, in other words, what Moses did, he, he built an altar, didn't he? And, and can anyone remember how many pillars he placed around the altar? It was 12. Because it says that one for each tribe of Israel. Now, before the fire of heaven came down in the times of Elijah, it tells us that he repaired an altar. And had they guessed how many stones he placed around it? What would you like it to be, brothers and sisters? Twelve stones. Each one marking the twelve tribes of Israel. And there Moses stood for 40 days and 40 nights speaking to Michael. And Michael, the archangel of God, gave Moses the prophet, the covenants, the testimonies, the judgments, the practices, the principles of how Israel were to worship. He was given the blueprint of the tabernacle, how the Levites would work, how the priests would ordain their ministry. And there was Moses in the heavenlies, but at the foot. Something different was happening altogether, wasn't there? Because not long after, God was going to stop Moses in his tracks and he was going to say to Moses, get back down to the camp for the people of Israel have broken the covenant already. And Moses starts to saunter down, his aged prophet, on the way down, he's going to meet Joshua. And Joshua, the warrior, says to Moses, oh, there's a noise coming down from the base of the camp. 
It sounds like war, he says to Moses. And Moses' response says, that's not the sound of war, Brother Joshua. That's the sound of music I hear. In fact, the words he says are, oh, that's the noise of music. So there was a great noise that was heard, wasn't there, at Sinai. What was being sung and what was the noise that was heard at the heights of Mount Carmel on the fateful day in which the fire came down from heaven? In fact, Elijah tells us, doesn't he? He calls out the prophets of Baal and he says, you make a noise. And what we find out is that the prophets of Baal were singing around a, around a, a god, a, a false deity. And in fact, it's the same word used. It's the same word used of Israel. That as Israel made a noise at the depths of Mount Carmel, so Israel made a noise at the heights of Mount Carmel. So the depths of Mount Sinai and the heights of Mount Carmel, it's the same word. Both groups were singing a song. And those two prophets now are going to be righteously angry, aren't they? Now, we know with Israel that they were worshipping a molten calf, weren't they? And the god in Elijah's time were worshipping the god Baal. Have a guess what form Baal was in. He was the calf and the bull god. In other words, Elijah saw them all dancing around and singing a molten Baal, a bull, a calf. Just as many years previously, Moses saw them dancing around a molten calf. And it's the same thing that's happening to Elijah. In fact, Elijah spurs them on, doesn't he? He says, cry aloud. And they all cried louder, responding to Elijah's jarring comments. And after the, the aftermath of this was, was a slaughter. Moses came down, didn't he? And he says, who is on the Lord's side? In fact, that's another hymn we sing, isn't it? And Moses definitely wouldn't have sung that. Who is on the Lord's side? And the Levites stood up. And they slaughtered those responsible at the foot of Mount Carmel. And Elijah then, years later, was to get the prophets of Baal. And at the river Kishon, he was to slaughter in like manner those prophets. And it just so happens to be, brothers and sisters, that the river Kishon is at the foot of Mount Carmel. A slaughter at the foot of two mountains. And now we can understand, can't we? why Elijah ran to the wilderness. Because he finds out after all this, that actually Israel hadn't changed, that Ahab hadn't changed, and actually Jezebel, more to the point, had still got her clutches on the hearts of Israel. The exodus hadn't happened that Elijah wanted so deeply. And so he feels it's only appropriate to go right back to the origins of the Exodus in the wilderness, more specifically to the mount in which it all began in Moses at Horeb. In 1 Kings chapter 19. In fact, if you still got your Bible open at 1 Kings 18, if you just flick over to 1 Kings 19. You'll, you'll see there in 1 Kings 19. And verse 8 that he's traveling to Horeb. And, and it tells us specifically in that particular verse that he travels 40 days and 40 nights. And more specifically, it tells us that he neither ate or drank as he travels to the mount where Moses stood. Just out of interest, how many days and how many nights was Moses up at Mount Horeb? 40. And just out of interest, what did he eat or drink? Nothing. So Elijah here is doing the same thing, isn't he? They are inseparable, aren't they? Moses and Elijah, they are intrinsically linked together in the tapestry of the word. And Elijah now is traveling to Horeb because something happened in Horeb, which we've just read about in Exodus chapter 32. I think he has an agenda here, does Elijah? A real agenda because he wants to ask something of God that God once requested of Moses. There's something in the mind of Elijah at this precise moment about Mount Horeb that he desperately wants. And we're going to find the answer, brothers and sisters, in Exodus 32. So, you know what? It might be easy to have one hand in Kings <laughs> and the other hand in Exodus 32. There's not too many toing and froing, but it just, it just might help. 
So uh, let's have a look. Exodus chapter 32. This is just after they'd worshipped the molten calf, and, and the Lord God now is furious with Israel. He's absolutely furious with them. And in verse 9 to 10, he's going to say to Moses, he says, And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. And behold, now therefore let me alone with them, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee, Moses, a great nation. What a responsibility. I mean, we're talking about Yahweh, the God of Israel here, going to Moses and speaking to him through his angel and saying, I'm sick of Israel. I am fed up with them. They'd only left Egypt 50 days ago. And he says, they're stiff-necked, they're stubborn, they're obstinate. Moses, let's start again. And I'll begin Israel with you. I'll make Israel out of you. I mean, this was momentous. I mean, imagine if the Lord Jesus Christ came to our ecclesias and says, I'm sick of them all, <laughs> but you I like. Let's start again. That's what's given to Moses right here. In other words, brothers and sisters, as far as God was concerned, and mark these words, Moses was the only one left. That's according to God. Now in Kings, in chapter 19 and verse 9, I'm going to pick up the story of Elijah. And you'll notice here that once he traveled 40 days and 40 nights, in verse 9, he's going to enter a cave. Now, I don't know what version you're reading, um, but where it says he entered a, a cave, it shouldn't say a cave. In the Hebrew, it has the definite article before it. It should say, and Elijah came to the cave. Which cave do you think it was? This is the cave of Moses. This is the cave Moses once stood and spoke directly to Michael on behalf of Israel. And Elijah here, he knows not only his history, but he knows his geography. This is the sacred cave, the holy cave of God. And Elijah has this agenda. He's going right to the heart of Israel at Horeb. And he comes into the cave. And this is why God speaks to him in the form of a question. Remember, years before, in that very cave, God had said to Moses, I'm going to start again with you because you are the only one left. And centuries later, Elijah walks into that very cave and a voice comes to him. What doest thou here, Elijah? What is it about my character that brings you to this particular place out of all the areas in all the world why do you find yourself in the middle of the desert in the heart of the wilderness in this one particular cave what is it about the history of the cave Elijah that brings you here and now Elijah or the spirit of this man brothers and sisters if only we had more Elijahs <laughs> he goes before God and who might you think be who might you think be, would be representing God here in 1 Kings 19? It's Michael. It's the same angel waiting for him at Horeb. And who might you think the angel was that fed Elijah and said, Go, for the journey is too great? It was Michael there. And now Elijah rubbing his hands together goes before Michael and he says these words. I'm going to read, I'm going to say them in the words I think, using my imagination, that Elijah would have said. Them. And Elijah said, ha, huh, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. Notice here in verse 9, in verse 10, he uses the covenant name. 
Out of interest, where was the covenant name of God first revealed? In that very cave. He's reminding the angel of the wager, isn't he? I've been very jealous for the Lord God of Israel, the name. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. Where was the covenant first given out of interest? In that very cave. And not only have the children of Israel forsaken your covenant, but they have thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And here's the point, brothers and sisters. This is the point. This is where everything is building to. Behold, only I am left. They seek to take my life away. You know, only I am left. And centuries before, God had said to Moses, oh, there are stiff-necked people. They're obstinate, they're stubborn. Let's start again with you, Moses, for only you are left. And now, Elijah, what do you think he's asking of God? What do you think he wants God to do? Notice what it says there in verse 10, that he uses the name, the Lord of hosts. Now, the Lord of hosts, what title is that? It's not El Shaddai, is it? What title is the Lord of hosts? <coughs> the God of armies. He wants to bring the God of armies in righteous anger to come down to Israel and to destroy the lot of them. And I wager to you, brothers and sisters, and I'm making the strong suggestion that he's requesting of God, that he starts again with him. Only I am left. That promise you made to Moses many moons ago, God, he says, well, here I am. I want the same request. Start again with me. And what was it that Moses said of God when he was told the words that he would start again with him? How did Moses respond to those words? What was the spirit of Moses like? Well, in Exodus 32, verse 11, I'll read these words to you. He says to God, oh, Father, relent your anger of them. He begs God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength not to destroy Israel. In fact, he goes more to the point of saying in verse 32, look, if you can't forgive them, take my life. It was only reading those words, brothers and sisters, that I truly understood the power of Moses. He knew at this point the character of God, and he felt utterly unworthy to hold its mantle. The responsibility of starting again with him was way too great because he understood brothers and sisters, and yet he was a man of the law. He understood human nature. And he was absolutely right, you know. Because we read in the, in, in the book of the Judges, in Judges 18, that Moses had a grandson. And the grandson of Moses was Jonathan. And you come to the end of the book of Judges, and Jonathan, the grandson of Moses, was the worst in Israel. If God had started again with him, in two generations, it would have been right back to the beginning. Moses understood human nature. He only knew, didn't he, Moses, that only one, only one could hand over the mantle, which was Christ, the seed of the woman. And Elijah, on the other hand, start again with me. Make Israel out of me. And the irony is that the very words Moses was suggesting is the complete opposite of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it says in Luke that Jesus did not come to destroy the world, but to save it. And Moses had the spirit of Christ, didn't he? And so what we find is that when we compare these two together, what we see is that, well, Elijah says, I am the only one left. And Moses says, count them among me. Elijah says they have sinned. And Moses says, pardon us from our sin. Elijah says, destroy them. And Moses says, refrain from their destruction. And whilst Moses was making intercession for Israel, Romans 11 tells us that Elijah was making intercession against Israel. Both had two completely different perspectives, didn't they? And I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters, we can easily at this point in this context utterly deride Elijah 
And how dare we? We're talking about a titan of faith in which Hebrews describes that the world is not worthy. They have got two completely different perspectives on two opposite ends of the spectrum. You see, Moses was all about mercy, wasn't he? All about mercy. And what does God teach Moses all through his ministry? What's the great lesson of Moses, do you think? The lesson of Moses was to understand God's judgments. Have you noticed that about Moses' life? I don't know whether you have noticed it. It came to me just looking at this, and I was staggered at how many times in the life of Moses God was teaching him about judgments. Nadab, judgment. Abihu, judgment. The spies, judgment. Korah, judgment. Everything in Moses' life is, well, is all about judgment, and yet he was a man of mercy. In, in other words, he may have been shown, showing too much mercy in his life, and God was trying to teach him about the other side of God's character. Elijah, on the other hand, well, he's all about truth. Now, have you noticed everything about Elijah's life? God is trying to teach him about what? Mercy. The ravens, mercy. The widow, mercy. Her son, mercy. The 7,000 who yet not bow their knee to Baal, mercy. The prophet Obadiah, mercy. The prophets in the cave, mercy. Because Elijah was showing way too much character on the element of truth. And so God is trying to teach him about mercy through his life. And that was the point there in Exodus 32, where Moses has count them among me, God was teaching him about judgment. And that's why in 1 Kings 19, when, when Elijah stood in the same cave, in the same mount, God was teaching him about mercy. And it's fascinating, isn't it? Because can anyone remember which mountain, and there's a clue, that God revealed his name? What was the name of the mountain? Horeb, the very same mount, in which God in Exodus 34 says to Moses, I am the Lord God of mercy, of gracious, long-suffering, abundant, and goodness and truth. That was the name of God established at Mount Horeb. What do we notice about the beginning and the end of God's character? It's bookended by two characteristics, isn't it? The beginning of his name, it's all about mercy, like Moses. And at the end of his name, it's all about truth, like Elijah. And in between the name of God, or in between those two bookends, we have the character. Two ends of the spectrum both right in their own way. And brothers and sisters, our entire ecclesial body is built upon those two principles, aren't they? Our entire ecclesial makeup is built upon ecclesias that represent truth, and other ecclesias might represent mercy. We may call them, brothers and sisters, liberal and conservative, which is political words, isn't it? We don't deal with politics. God describes them as being truth and mercy. And we could identify, couldn't we, those ecclesias because they have their own characteristics. And we can look at it on a macro scale and we can look at it on a micro scale. We might show in our lives certain characteristics of mercy and others of us could be very truthful and judgmental, and righteous in our own way. And it tells me something, that both ends of the spectrum aren't quite right. If we're showing too much truth and too little mercy, we've got it wrong. And if we're showing too much mercy and too little truth, we've got it wrong. We've got to try and meet in the middle, but we'll never get it right. There's only one man who showed truth and mercy perfectly. And his name is Jesus of Nazareth. Humor me with this question, brothers and sisters. When the Lord Jesus Christ was transfigured and he shone perfectly the character of God that we see there, who was standing either side of him? Moses and Elijah. The two bookends of God's character, mercy and truth, and there at the center of it all was the man who got it spot on, the Lord. You know, Psalm 85 tells us that mercy and truth have met together 
and have kissed one another. I just wonder, brothers and sisters, at the Mount of Transfiguration, whether or not those three men greeted each other with a holy kiss. For mercy and truth have kissed for the very first time at the Mount. It's fascinating that it all took place at a Mount, didn't it? You know, there was something more going on at Sinai, and particularly here at the Mount of Transfiguration, because, brothers and sisters, there was a conversation that took place that day, or I believe it was at night, actually. Those three men, those three great men, were having a conversation, and Luke tells us something specific about what they spoke about. He tells us that they spoke about his decease. That was the conversation on that night, was three disciples fell asleep. It was the crucifixion. And in that crucifixion, brothers and sisters, we have the definition of truth and mercy. Because flesh had to be crucified, didn't it? Truth. But in that, there was an escape. Redemption. Mercy. In other words, brothers and sisters, in a very long-winded way, at that evening, on that mount, Moses, Elijah, and the Lord spoke about how to save you and I. They spoke about us in the kingdom. And actually, when it says in Luke that they spoke about his decease, well, the Greek has a very different word. Because the actual word decease is the Greek word exodus. They spoke about an exodus. And what two better people to speak to about an exodus than Moses and Elijah together? What better people? Moses led a past exodus, didn't he? Out of the bondage of Egypt where he led hundreds of thousands of Israelites out of Egypt into the promised land. That was Moses. What of Elijah, brothers and sisters? How does the theme of the exodus fit in Elijah's life? We only have to go to Malachi chapter 4 and we quickly figure out that Elijah is going to lead a future exodus. All through his life, that's all he wanted to do, wasn't it? Was lead an exodus. And prior to the return of Jesus, Elijah is going to be sent out to the four corners of the earth to bring Israel back to what they call home. Jerusalem. He's going to be Moses reborn Moses in the past Elijah in the future and Jesus in the present the three exoduses together on the mount of transfiguration and they led a life of disappointment didn't they all three of them all of them found themselves in the wilderness all three of them were rejected by their own people but Moses and Elijah they became forerunners didn't they and they became forerunners for two people Moses became a forerunner of a man called Joshua. And Elijah became a forerunner for a person called Elisha. And you know what? Joshua and Elisha have the same name. One is called Yah saves, and the other one is called salvation of Yah. And if you get those two words, Elisha and Joshua together, well, and you, you figure out their names, you find out there's another man in scripture who's named exactly the same way. Who else in the Bible is called Yah saves? His name is called Jesus. And how appropriate that those two men pass the baton on to two other men called Jesus, only then for the, on the Mount of Transfiguration to pass the baton on the second time to the man called Jesus. I don't know about you, but I think Moses' life and Elijah's life and all the highs and all the lows and all the despondencies and all the joys was all preparing them for that moment at the Mount of Transfiguration. Why wouldn't it be, brothers and sisters? The whole world hung in the balance. Jesus was in a time of crisis. And he rose up two men who'd gone through it all to encourage the master for the final three and a half months. What a conversation, what a thrill for them. All together. And there is Elijah saying, I am the only one left. 
And on that mount, he saw the only begotten one. He knew right then that he was talking to mercy and truth together. And just out of interest, when Elijah comes to save Israel, where is he going to be sent from? Horeb. The very mount that Moses stood, and the very mount that Elijah was stood, and Elijah is going to walk in the footsteps of his predecessor in the future. And how might you think the pharaohs of this world are going to react when a man like Elijah is going to come and redeem Israel? How might you think the Egypt of this world will respond to his request? Resistance. They will harden their hearts, brothers and sisters. And Daniel 12 tells us that a great troubling time will come upon Israel, that they will cry out to the Lord from the taskmasters of this world. And Elijah will be sent. And he'll be taken. And he will speak to the world, let my people go. And there it will begin, the second exodus, where Israel will walk through the wilderness of the nations together, not coming to the promised land, but coming to Jerusalem. And leading them will be a man called Elijah, the hero of faith, the next Moses. Thank you. Well, we, we left off, didn't we, at the Mount of Transfiguration, and there Moses and Elijah were encouraging Jesus for the exodus out of sin into redemption. Glorious image we see there at the Mount. And well, we, we saw, didn't we, that, well, it was going to be Elijah who took the mantle from Moses. And we're going to find that in this session, somebody is going to take the mantle off Elijah. Who might that person be? John, and of course, the person we've just read, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul now is going to walk in the footsteps of Elijah, just as Elijah walked in the footsteps of Moses. Now, we've just read Acts chapter 9, and there's a conversation here of Paul between him and his Lord, and he's blinded by the light in Acts chapter 9. And then in verse 8 to 11, he's being told then to go to Damascus. And if you look at verse 10 to 11, as Paul, well, I should call him Saul, really, shouldn't I, at this point? But, well, he has been converted. So Paul now is in Damascus. He's in a house. And meanwhile, as all this is taking place, God now, or, or maybe Jesus, visits a man called Ananias in Acts chapter 9, verse 10 to 11. And Ananias has been told then to go and greet a man called Paul in Damascus. And I tell you what, brothers and sisters, Ananias knew exactly who Saul or Paul was. Paul? Saul? The Pharisee? And he's been told, go and greet Paul. And you'll find him there in a house praying. You imagine the surprise of Ananias coming to the house in Damascus and seeing there soon to be the Apostle Paul praying. The legacy of Paul had already been spread, that he had been at the hands of the murder of Stephen the martyr. And now we see a converted man at Damascus in this particular house. And Saul there is being given a vision. So they've got quite a number of events happening at the same time. As Paul is praying, he sees a vision of Ananias coming to him. And Ananias knows about all Saul's wrongdoings and now he has the authority, Saul has the authority to go to the Gentiles. And in verse 15, the Lord said to Ananias, this man, out of all the myriads of people, it's going to be this man, Saul, who is going to be the vessel to carry my name to the Gentiles, to kings and to the children of the earth, to the extent of all the Roman Empire. 4, verse 16, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. There's going to be a suffering of Paul for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice this phrase here, or this particular word, for I will show. 
This is Jesus speaking to Ananias. I will show is exactly the same word that means to show physically. Saul is going to receive an image of his suffering, and he's going to be shown it physically. Saul is going to be given a forewarning of the things he must suffer for Christ, and Ananias now is going to come and meet Paul, Saul, to explain to him that Jesus is going to show him the things he must suffer. He's going to be shown something, is Saul. Now, I want us to notice some of the phrases here when Ananias comes and greets Paul the Apostle. Notice the phrase, it says in verse 17, that he laid his hands on him. And then once he laid his hands on him, that Saul or Paul rose and was baptized. And then in verse 19, Paul took food and was strengthened. There were three things, three crucial things. Ananias comes to him, explains to him this vision that he's going to see to show him the things that he must suffer. And then Ananias places his hands on him. Saul then raises up. He was baptized. And then taking food, he was then strengthened. Now, where does Paul go next? Well, have a look in verse 19. And when he received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. So you've got a little phrase here. This is the only technical bit. But you've got a little word there that says, then was Saul certain days. Can you see that the moment he was strengthened, and you see that full stop, and then you have the phrase, then was Saul certain days, there seems to be a period of time missing between the full stop after strengthened and then the word then. There's a whole section of time that's not mentioned in verse 19. We've got a whole period of time in verse 19 that's not whispered or uttered in the pages of Acts chapter 9. It's missing something. There's a change happening here in this particular verse. There's a transition into something. And the emphasis is that Paul did something before going to Damascus. Because it says, then was Saul certain days with his disciples in Damascus. In other words, brothers and sisters, Saul or Paul did something before he went to Damascus. And so the question we're going to ask, where was Paul for a period of time before he then goes to Damascus. Well, I think Paul actually tells us. He tells us in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 17, listen to these words, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, and neither did I go to Damascus, but I went to Arabia. Now look there in verse 19, where it says, then was Saul certain days, Galatians 1 and verse 17 actually fits in that little pocket there between the full stop and the word then, because in that period, before he goes to Damascus, Paul says he went to Arabia. Arabia he goes. In fact, the emphasis here is that he departed from Damascus and goes to Arabia. There was something about Arabia that compelled Paul to go. There was something mystical, something mysterious, something sacred, something holy about Arabia. In fact, he says in Galatians 1 and verse 16 that immediately he went. And the moment Ananias touched him, the moment Ananias baptized him, and the moment he ate and was strengthened, up he gets and he goes straight to Arabia, which is hundreds of miles away. Paul tells us in Galatians that not only immediately did he go to Arabia, but he, he didn't speak to one person. He actually says the words, I conferred not with flesh. He did not talk to anybody and immediately went to Arabia. He was alone, brothers and sisters, a lonely man embarking on a journey, leaving the house in which he was praying from the moment he was baptized. So the question is, what is so significant, brothers and sisters? about Arabia. Why does he go to Arabia? What is something so special about this place? We could ask the question, couldn't we, brothers and sisters, as God asked the question to Elijah, what doest thou in Arabia, Paul? I think Paul tells us. In fact, I don't think I know he tells us. In Galatians 4 and verse 25, he explains to us that Arabia is none other than Sinai. 
And which place do you think he would have gone specifically at Sinai? Because Sinai is a big place. Let me ask a better question. What cave might Paul have walked into on that fateful day in the Sinaitic Peninsula? I believe, brothers and sisters, he went to the very cave in which Moses stood. I believe he went to the very cave in which Elijah stood. He went to the cave at one very particular mount, Horeb, in which God describes it as being the mount of God. What doest thou here, Paul? What is it about my character that brings you here? And he traveled through the wilderness to get there, hadn't he? Just, well, as Moses had traveled through the wilderness and just as Elijah. And so the words that were spoken to Ananias in verse 16, I will show him how great things he must suffer. Where was Saul going to be shown these things? He was going to be shown them, I believe, anyway, at Sinai. Paul is going to go to the very place, isn't he? He's going to the origins of the history of Israel. And, well, he's begun a new journey, hasn't he? Paul, he's been baptized now into the saving name of Jesus. And what better place to go to, to start a new exodus, to start a new journey, than where it all began in Exodus chapter 19, at, at the wilderness journey into, into Sinai. And that's where he goes, to the Mount of God. You know, we call this the road to Damascus, Acts 9, don't we? <laughs> that's what we call it. The road to Damascus. This isn't the road to Damascus. This is the road to Horeb. And that's where he's going. And so we ask the question, I think you're already there, aren't you? I've got to ask it. Who else <laughs> was taught by God on Mount Sinai at Horeb? Who else was given divine revelations by God at all, Reb. Well, of course, it's the two brethren, the two prophets that we've been speaking about, Moses and Elijah. You know, we told, we said, didn't we, in the previous study that Moses and Elijah were both forerunners for people called Jesus. One was called Yahshua, the other one was called Elisha. Yah saves and salvation of Yah, the names of Jesus. And there they pass the baton of the truth on to be forerunners. What do you think Paul's going to be doing? Paul is going to be our third forerunner. In fact, he's going to be the fourth, isn't he? Because there's John, the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Christ. And we have four forerunners. And I have an interest in, where was John based? He was a voice where? In the wilderness. It just so happens to be not far from where the River Jordan is, there's a huge mountain range called Sinai. And so we have four runners, one Moses, one Elijah, one John the Baptist, and the other one, believe it or not, it's going to be Paul. And they're all forerunners for people called Jesus. And here he is now, running with all of his life to get to Horeb. You know, Paul was going to share the same experiences, wasn't he? Where, where Ananias was told that Paul would suffer the sufferings of Christ. Would you agree with me that like Moses and like Elijah, Paul also was rejected by his own people? Terrible disappointment, wasn't he? He was going to bear to suffer Christ. And you know what, brothers and sisters, it was his privilege to do so. To walk in the spirit of his Lord gave him tremendous joy. He's going to share the same responsibilities, the same burdens, the same highs, the same lows as his predecessors. And there's one person in particular I think Paul took a lot of inspiration from. Moses was the man who inspired Elijah. Who might have inspired Paul? Elijah the prophet. And in our previous session, we saw Elijah walk in the very footprints of Moses. And in this session, we're going to see exactly the same thing, but in reverse. We're going to see now Paul walk in the very footsteps of Elijah because he's going to be in the spirit of Elijah. You know, what was Elijah's message to God? Israel deserved what? Destruction. He was a man with vengeance running through his veins. Israel need to be destroyed. And he goes to Horeb to demand of God to unleash his angelic host upon Israel. He couldn't stand Israel. 
Only I am left, he says. What was the spirit of Saul the Pharisee? He wanted the Christians destroyed and removed and stamped out, for he saw them as the seed of the serpent. He's in the very spirit, isn't he, of Elijah? But there's a transformation we've seen with Saul here. And just like a relay race, brothers and sisters, this is all it is. They're running a race, aren't they? And Paul actually says those words. We run the race. And the whole point is to pass the baton on. Running with all their might. Moses ran with it. And years later, Elijah was to pick up that. And he was to run with it. And then years later, John the Baptist was to pick up the baton and he was to run with it. And now it's going to fall upon the mantle of Paul to continue the race. And he's going to pass the baton on to who? Timothy. Finish the course, my brother. Run the race. For there is laid upon me a crown of righteousness. So, well, let's, let's begin. Let's go to the beginning of the journey in Acts chapter 9. And you'll see there in Acts 9 and verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. So there we have it, the spirit of Elijah here. He wanted destruction on God's people. God's people now were the Christians, new Israel, spiritual Israel. And then in verse 10, he comes to Damascus and meets a man called Ananias. And Ananias now has a message to Paul. You know the name of Ananias, you know what it means? Yahweh graciously gives. And Ananias now has got a, a gracious message for Paul. He's a messenger, brothers and sisters. Ananias. Uh, what's another word for a messenger? Angel. An angel. He's going to be an angel to Paul right now with, with a gracious message. And, and the message is, go to Horeb. You're going to be shown the things you must suffer. And Paul gets up and goes to Horeb. Out of interest, who does Elijah meet in the middle of the wilderness? He's going to meet an angel, isn't he? 1 Kings 19 verse 5 tells us that Elijah met a gracious messenger, an angel. And that angel was going to comfort Elijah. And in the very same way, that angel is going to tell Elijah to go to Horeb. We remember, don't we, what happened with Ananias? Right? Look at verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and, and put his hands upon him. Can anyone remember what the angel did to Elijah? It was the first thing. The angel, what would you like it to be? He laid his hands on him. The angel touched Elijah. And many, 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 many years later, the messenger of God named Ananias was going to place his hands upon Paul. And after doing this, Paul's eyes were opened, weren't they? And well, what happened next in the story of Paul's conversion? Well, he arose and, and was baptized. What do you think happened once the angel of God touched Elijah? What was the next thing that happened? Well, the same phrase. He arose up. And then Ananias, once he laid his hands upon Paul. Once Paul rose up, it tells us then that Paul ate, drank, and was strengthened. What do you think happened with the angel of God to Elijah in 1 Kings 19? Well, believe it or not, the same thing happens. The angel fed him, the angel watered him, and the same language is that he rose up and he was strengthened. And then Elijah goes onto his quest and he goes to Mount Horeb and he sees three miracles, doesn't he? Three divine miracles given by the Almighty in that fateful day, in that particular cave. He saw the wind, he saw the earthquake, and then he saw the fire. And the description were given in 1 Kings 19 that the earth quaked and the, the rock was, the, the mountain was rent and the rocks fell. And he, he almost backed back into the, into the cave, you know, at the majesty and the might of God. And there God showed himself in the wind and the earthquake and the fire. Just out of interest, the opening of Acts, there were three miracles. Can anyone remember what those miracles were? Well, in Acts chapter 2, there was a rushing wind. But in Acts chapter 4, 
there was a mighty earthquake. And in Acts chapter 2, the apostles' tongues were lit on fire. In the book of Acts, there was a wind, there was an earthquake, and there was a fire. And there God brought his Holy Spirit upon those men in those three miracles. And they were then going to be the power of God on earth, weren't they? Those apostles, and they were given the Holy Spirit. And Elijah, many years before, saw the same miracle. But what was given to Elijah? What would you suggest was the greatest miracle of them all? It was a still, small voice. In fact, the Hebrew is that it was the quietness of a gentle whisper. And there in that little voice was earth-shattering power. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ revealed himself to Paul, what did Paul hear on the road to Damascus, which led him to the road of Sinai? What was the first thing he heard? He heard a voice. And may I suggest, and it's a strong suggestion, that the voice in which it revealed itself was a still, small voice. And you know the voice of Elijah, it re revealed itself to him as a question, didn't it? What doest thou hear, Elijah? And how did the voice reveal itself to Paul? Well, it too revealed itself as a question, didn't it? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And it might just be that Saul heard that as the still small voice right there on the road to Damascus. You know, when we say the name Paul, this is fascinating. We call Paul little, don't we? And we think, you know, we tend to think that's the meaning of his name. But it doesn't, his name doesn't mean little. Do you know what his name means? A gentle, little whisper. Paul was to be the still, small voice. His name means the quietness of a small whisper. If you look at the real Greek and you get into the nitty gritty, we just call him little. But actually, his name means a gentle whisper. And brothers and sisters, that gentle whisper began with him. Make no mistake about it. It all began with Paul because he was going to be the man who was going to be the light to the Gentiles. And it began with Paul as a little whisper many centuries ago. And over the years, that little whisper has been gaining other whispers. And time after time, as history moves forward into the future, the little voice that began with Paul has been gaining a lot of energy. Brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep centuries gone by, brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in not so distant past, have all <laughs> taken the voice that still small voice. And over the centuries into the future, the voice is going to be gathering momentum and momentum and momentum. And it's going to get louder and louder and louder and louder. And when you come to the book of Revelation, it's no longer a gentle whisper, is it? The voice of the saints is like the sound of many waters. All together, the little whispers have now got the sound of trumpets. But it all began with Paul the Apostle at Mount Sinai as he begins the Exodus, brothers and sisters, not of the Hebrews, but he begins the Exodus of the Gentiles. And that's where he was, at Sinai. And we think about Moses. Moses was revealed at Sinai, the character of God, wasn't he? He saw the fullness and the richness and the, the full spectrum of the character of God. Elijah, on the other hand, didn't see the character of God, but he heard the voice of God, didn't he? And Moses and Elijah at the Mount of Transfiguration saw the character of God and heard the voice of God in the Son of God. And now Paul is going to go to the location of the mountains of Sinai, and he's going to see, isn't he, the character of God and the richness of God in something specific as a sign is given to him in Sinai. 
There's an important thread between the two, isn't there? Elijah, the exodus of the future. Moses, the exodus of the past. And Paul, the exodus of the Gentiles. And there they are, the two of them together. And we bring in Paul the third. We've got the exodus of the Gentiles. So here's a question. Paul is going to see divine revelation. And we know that because, well, Moses saw divine re revelation and Elijah heard divine revelation. At Sinai, we believe it was Michael who taught Moses about the Levitical proceedings and the priesthood in the law of Moses. We also believe that it was Michael who uttered the still small voice and brought down the windy earthquake and fire to Elijah the prophet. Michael, his name means he who is like Yah. The archangel, the angel of the host of Israel. Daniel 12 calls Michael the prince of the host. So the question is, if Michael revealed himself to Moses and Elijah on behalf of the father, who might you think revealed himself to Paul at Sinai? Who is the great prince of God? Who is like unto Yah? Who now is the greater than Michael? Who do you think it's going to be that's waiting for Paul at Sinai? Who is the rightful person to speak to the man, Saul, who became Paul? Because we're told in Galatians 1 and verse 12 that Paul says, At Sinai, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but I was given the revelation of Jesus Christ. In fact, that word revelation that Paul uses in Galatians is also used in Revelation 1, verse 1. And what was given in Revelation 1, John on the Isle of Patmos was to give, be given a personal revelation by Jesus. In fact, the word revelation is exactly what you think it's going to mean, a revealing, an appearance. So I'm going to ask the question again. Who do you think was waiting for Paul at Sinai on that fateful day? Who do you think was going to teach the greatest apostle, the greatest exodus? Jesus. You know, as a young boy, Saul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And as an adult... He was to find himself sitting at the foot of Christ in a cave in Horeb. As Christ now is going to reveal to him how to lead the exodus of the Gentiles. Have you ever wondered how Paul in Acts chapter 9 got all this knowledge? He confounded everybody. Nobody could challenge him. And just a five verses previously, he was a doubter of the Lord. Where do you think he got his inspiration from? Where do you think he got the knowledge from? And as Moses saw the character and Elijah heard the voice, it came upon Paul and he saw it all. And he heard it all. A conversation took place at Horeb about how to save you and I. Just as a conversation took place on the Mount of Transfiguration, how to save you and I. Jesus spoke to Moses and he spoke to Elijah and he spoke to Paul all about the Exodus. And you know, when Moses was at Mount Sinai, he was given the law, wasn't he? And the law was a schoolmaster that could lead us to Christ. And when he came down that mount, his face shone. How do you think Paul's face would have looked when he came down the very same mount, having been taught about grace? Use your imagination, brothers and sisters. Isaiah tells us that he was to become the light of the Gentiles. The man's face, I have no doubt, shone radiantly. Being in the presence of Christ in his glory, just as they were at the Mount of Transfiguration. He'd already been, he'd already been given the light, hadn't he, on the road to Damascus. 
Christ shone his light upon him, didn't he? And he was blinded from it. Now he's going to reveal it. He's going to reveal the light. Acts chapter 13, verse 47, Paul himself says the Lord had told him that he was to be a light to the Gentiles. He came down that mountain, brothers and sisters, I have no doubt, like a blazing fire. What happened when he got back? What happened when he got back at Damascus? So, so all that, brothers and sisters, all what we've gone through took place between that full stop and the word then in Acts chapter 9. A whole episode is missing. It's not yet picked up in Galatians. And now we can revisit Paul in Acts chapter 9 when he finally gets to Damascus. So Acts 9 and verse 20. And straight away he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. You imagine, right? You know, you imagine seeing Saul, now Paul, the gentle whisper, come to Damascus and he's filled with it. Look at verse 21. They're amazed at him. They're utterly bewildered. Is this the same Saul we saw in Jerusalem? Something has changed with him. He's gone through a transformation. Almost like he's being transfigured, isn't it? He's a different man altogether, and they're utterly amazed. Look at verse 22. Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Where's he got all this understanding? Where's he got all this passion and zeal? Where has he got the truth? He got it from his Lord, 600 miles away at Sinai. And now he's got the understanding on how to lead the Exodus. And just as Moses came to the Pharaohs of this world, let my people go. Paul is going to the Jews and the Romans now. Let my people go. He's going to meet resistance, isn't he? He's going to meet tremendous resistance. You know, in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses was seeing the burning bush, Moses requested of God and said, how do I do it? How do I persuade Pharaoh to unleash his torture upon your people. How do I do it? You know what God says? A voice. I give you a voice. Elijah, many years later, was to find himself on the very same mount. How do I do it? How do I show mercy upon your people if you're not in the wind and the earthquake and the fire? How do I do it? God gives to him a voice. What do you think Jesus gave to Paul if his name means the gentle whisper? He gave him a voice, brothers and sisters. And we see the product of that voice in Acts chapter 9, where he confounded a lot of them. That they were amazed at his spirit. They were amazed that he was proving that this was the Christ the seed of the woman, the star of David, the root of Jesse. And actually notice there that Saul increased more in strength. You know, many years later, the Apostle Paul was to find himself in something known as the Tuli Island prison in Rome. And he had a death sentence. And just like Elijah had a death sentence from Jezebel, Paul eventually, he too, was to have a death sentence. And he writes to his son in the faith in the Tuli Arlen prison, which was a torture hole. And he was soon to face the beheading at the expense of Nero. And he's inspired then to write his final letter to his son in the faith, Timothy, in which Timothy then was to be passed the baton on to. And he says to Timothy, he says, don't worry, my brother. Don't worry, my son. He says, because the Lord stood with me and gave me strength. And look at the phrase you see there in verse 22, Saul increased more in strength. Jesus stood with this man and strengthened him. And he, too, was able to pass the baton on and give courage and strength to the one who was to come. And, you know, when Elijah received the lesson of the still small voice, can anyone remember where he was told to go to? 
When Elijah heard the still small voice, he was told to go to a specific location. Let me ask a better question. Where would you like it to be? He was told to go to Damascus. And where did Paul the Apostle go straight after he received the still small voice at Sinai? He was told to go to Damascus where he confounded the lot of them. And just out of interest, what did Elijah end up doing once he'd gone to Damascus? He was there to anoint various people along the way. And when Paul was sent to Damascus, what was he told to do? Well, he was told to baptize various people along the way. And what happened to Elijah whilst he was at Damascus? Because it didn't go well for Elijah. <laughs> he too had to suffer like Christ, didn't he? And when Elijah was sent to Damascus, it tells us that, well, Jezebel was after him. And that the king of Israel was after him. And, and notice this, King Ahab was a Hebrew, wasn't he? He was a Jew and he married a Gentile. And so when Elijah goes to Damascus, he knows full well that the Jews and the Gentiles are after him at Damascus. What was Paul to find in the very same place after leaving the very same place Elijah came from? He too, in Acts 9 and verse 23, found that there was a conspiracy amongst the Jews to kill him. There's our Hebrews. And we're also told in verse 29 that the Grecians also in Damascus sought to slay him as well. And there's the Gentiles. He's public enemy number one, isn't he, Paul? In fact, it's at Damascus in 2 Corinthians 11, we're told that the king of Damascus was after him and wanted to capture him. So we've got a king also who's after Paul, just like King Ahab was after Elijah, the king of Israel and his wife. You know, brothers and sisters, over these two, those, these two sessions, we have been following, haven't we, that, that place Horeb. And we've been following, you know, three incredible men as they, they run this race together. But there's one other man, isn't there? Who, who truly did lead the greatest exodus, not just for the Hebrews and not just for the Gentiles, but for both. How did Jesus begin his mission as he began his exodus? He was going to meet somebody called the messenger, says Malachi. And the word messenger in Malachi is the Hebrew word malak, which means an angel. Who was the angel that greeted Jesus in his life? It was his forerunner, John. And how did John greet Jesus of Nazareth, his cousin? Well, it tells us that he laid his hands upon him. Just like the angel laid his hands upon Elijah and just like Ananias laid his hands upon Paul. And then after John laid his hands upon Jesus, John, the messenger of Malachi, it says then that Jesus rose up. Just as Paul rose up and just as Elijah rose up. And then Jesus of Nazareth, after receiving strength, Mark tells us he immediately went somewhere. Just as Paul immediately went somewhere and just as Elijah immediately went somewhere. Where might the place be? And don't jump two spaces ahead. He went to the wilderness, didn't he? Just like Elijah went to the wilderness, just as Moses went to the wilderness, and just like Paul went to the wilderness, so, so too, the greatest of them all, Jesus went to the wilderness. It's actually in the Gospel of Luke that Luke colors in just a little bit of texture. Because once he went to the wilderness, he was then tempted, wasn't he? But Luke tells us he was tempted at a specific location in a specific area in the wilderness. In fact, Luke tells us that Jesus went to a high mountain. 
So what high mountain do you think Jesus of Nazareth went to after rising up, after being his hands laid upon, and after seeing the, the angel of John? Where in the wilderness do you think the mountain was that Jesus went to? What specific location? What doest thou here, Jesus of Nazareth? What is it about this particular location that brings you here? I think he went to the very mount where all the exoduses began. Horeb. That's where Moses went. That's where Elijah went. That's where Paul went. And actually, that's the very place in which Elijah is going to be sent from. I think Jesus went to Horeb. And I think Jesus was tempted in a little cave. In a holy place. Where, where a little flame burned once and a mountain was on fire. The very place where God revealed his name, I will be whom I will be. And there, centuries later, he stood. Jesus. In a little cave in the middle of the wilderness. How long was Elijah there for? Or how long was Elijah walking there for? 40 days and 40 nights. And how long was Moses there for? Well, 40 days and 40 nights. And just out of interest, how long was Jesus in the wilderness for? 40 days and 40 nights. I think the Bible is really compelling us to add one and one together and make two. In this case, the two is the Horeb, isn't it? And then when Jesus was tempted, it says angels came down to minister unto him. Now, it was Michael who ministered to Moses, and it was Michael who ministered to Elijah, and it was Jesus who ministered to Paul. The question is, who might have been the angel to minister to Christ? Gabriel, the angel of the Lord. And I believe it was a, the angel Gabriel who gave Jesus the voice because right after this moment, he was going to go into Galilee and become a fisher of men and catch up his disciples. He was to become the voice now, brothers and sisters. It was John's and now it's Jesus's. He's going to be the voice of his Lord. And so in our studies, Moses led a past exodus. Paul leads the exodus of the Gentiles. And Elijah is going to lead the future exodus of the Hebrews. And Jesus is leading the current exodus out of sin. There's going to be a time where we're going to be called to lead an exodus as well. The saints. Which mountain do you think we'll be called from? And I'll leave that for you to answer yourselves. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org if you enjoyed the episode then please share it with others until next time may god bless you in your studies and your walk towards god's kingdom amen